Welcome to Taking Care of Business on News Talk 1180-KERN. For the best in Saturday talk radio at 1 o'clock and on 1230-KGEO at 10 o'clock Saturday. And for the best in Wednesday talk radio on 1410-KERI. And now on 1000-KKIM in Albuquerque, New Mexico. What day is that on Albuquerque? Uh, Albuquerque, we're on Saturday. Did you know that? No, I thought it was Sunday. No, Saturday at 4 o'clock. Aren't we something? I actually had somebody in British Columbia listening to the show in Albuquerque, which I thought was kind of odd. Oh. Yeah, what are you going to do? Anybody in Albuquerque listening? Uh, I think so. Oh, hope so. Actually, we're going to have the uh, New Mexico governor on in a couple weeks. Your host is Clay Kerner, and I'm Marty Pay. Our producer is The Rock. Rocky's in studio with us. Hey, Clay, we had a great show last week with uh, an old friend of mine, author, professor, TV commentator, Bruce Hershenson. That was interesting. Yeah. Bruce yeah. is one heck of a knowledgeable guy. Yeah, he is. What I can't believe is that when it came to Syria, you and I and Bruce were on opposite ends of the spectrum. That surprised me. Yeah, it's unfortunate for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been invited to one of his roundtable discussions at Pepperdine University, and I'm definitely, definitely going to tell go. me Tell me why we should attack a country that has never attacked us, has no threat against us. I'll tell you what. Maybe that might even be a question that might even be appropriate for our first guest. That's let's, good. Let's see where that goes. Our second guest, Crystal Fregero from Channel 23, was great. Uh, she came into my class later that night and uh, gave a great talk about the media. You were there. Yeah, great class. Yeah, I was, was really surprised. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Here, four to six. Money. I'm, I'm getting back. <laughs> yeah, you I'm are getting, getting back. back. <laughs> Here, four to six every day. Tip your waitress. Uh, today, we've got another incredible show. A- and I feel, to be honest with you, a little humble to be able to do this show today because we've got two great guests, um, two really, really important guests. In the second half, we have Tara O'Grady, whose father, Colonel O'Grady, was a POW in Vietnam. She's got a very, very fascinating story. But by phone right now, we have a great guest I've really been looking forward to talking to, author, combat historian, Patrick O'Donnell. Pat, welcome to Taking Care of Business. Great to be on the air with you, Marty. And and Clay. Clay's awake. He'll be awake for the next couple of minutes. Yeah, but Marty does most of the talking, as you'll find out. (laughs) I'm just the pretty face. (laughs) And if he's the pretty face, we're in deep trouble. Uh, Pat, you're a best-selling author of eight books and a dozen commentaries. Tell us about your new book, Dog Company, The Boys of uh, Pointe de Hawk. Pointe de Hawk is, uh, is the backdrop that Ronald Reagan used in, in the 40th anniversary for D-Day. This is the cliff that 225 Rangers scaled this 90-foot cliff on D-Day to take out six big guns that threatened the entire invasion. And Dog Company is a band of brothers on that single company that destroyed five of those guns that day, which was the most important objective on D-Day and one of the toughest missions. So my my book is about that story. And over the last 20 years, I've interviewed close to 5,000 World War II veterans. And one of my, some of my most vivid memories have been with members of Dog Company. And um, I wrote a book back in 1999 for Simon Schuster that was a bestseller called Beyond Valor. And I had a couple stories in there from Dog Company Rangers, and I always wanted to do a single treatment on that company, and I got my chance to do that with uh, with Dog Company. It's really been a, a real honor. It's probably it's one of my last probably World War II books where the actual veterans are alive. You know, sadly, out of those 5,000 veterans I've interviewed, so many of them have, have faded away. Yeah. You know, Pat, I, I'm kind of familiar with that story. I've read a couple of books on it. And uh, that's probably the toughest job of D-Day was that particular uh, mission. But the interesting thing to me is they didn't really talk about it on The Longest Day. Do you know why? In that, you know, classic movie about D-Day, The Longest Day. The Longest Day is a great movie, <laughs> with the exception of the Point the Hawk piece. They, um, they got the first part of it right, where they, you know, the on top of the cliff, the Germans were throwing potato masher grenades. They were cutting the the, the grappling hooks, the, the the ropes that connected them, and they were firing down with their MG42 machine guns. But they get to the top and they mislead the audience by believing that the guns aren't there. They are not in the casements. They were just towed 500 yards inland in an apple orchard, and these things were ready to go. The ammunition was on the side, and they were ready to fire on Utah Beach or Omaha Beach, they could easily be turned either way or even uh, against the ships out in the channel. And 
what's incredible about the story is that two rangers took out five of those guns single-handedly a mission that was earmarked for over a thousand men and they they threw a thousand bombers at this objective and none of the bombs hit the target remarkably this is before precision guided munitions etc and uh it the story of really a story of how a single or one or two people can change the course of history. How big was Dog Company? How many men? It was uh, roughly about uh, 120 men. 120 and, men. Yeah, it's a sm- it's smaller than a regular, smaller than a regular infantry company. And how many sur- um, how many survived? It depends on which part of the war you're talking about. Oh, um, that that particular invasion. I'm compelling talking. piece of that is that nearly every single man in Dog Company on D-Day was either uh, killed or wounded. Wow! I have a I have a um, a very like a pretty powerful graphic where Len Lamel, who's the main character of my book. It puts together a single page where he writes down every person that was on in Dog Company um, on D-Day, and nearly all of them are either killed or wounded. Well, that's incredible. Only one or two guys escaped without getting one wounded. Many men, like Lamel, was wounded. they were wounded twice. Yet they took, shot in the side with a machine gun bullet. Yet they took out all those gun barracks. Yeah, yeah and then they even held. The position, the the secondary objective was to cut the road that went across the top of Point de Hoc, which Point de Hoc, for those of you that don't know, is a peninsula, a rocky peninsula that juts out between Omaha and Utah Beach. So it was the ideal observation post for the Germans uh, to put not only eyes on both beaches, but also put artillery, which could shell either beach, and and therefore became the number one objective on D-Day to take out these guns. Um, and the Ranger's secondary objective was to cut the road that ran across the top of Point to Hawk that connected Omaha Beach with Utah Beach. If they didn't cut that road, the Germans could basically ferry reinforcements from either beach if they wanted to. Sure. We're having a conversation with Patrick O'Donnell, author, combat historian, whose latest book is Dog Company. Uh, Pat, another question I had for you is, you can consider yourself, when I look at your bio, a combat historian. What is a combat historian? You know, people have asked me that. You know, what what uh, what is that title? And the, the title is um, one that that I um, I earned in in Iraq. I I was the only civilian historian to be in uniform with a Marine rifle platoon during the Battle of Fallujah, and I spent the entire um, the entire battle with a rifle platoon. I actually fought in Fallujah as a civilian, which is a first um, with that platoon, and, and we barely, I barely survived. It was, we had the highest number of casualties for a single rifle platoon in the entire battle. And I wrote a best-selling book afterwards to sort of memorialize the efforts of a lot of those men, uh, many who didn't come back. It's called We Were One. It's also required reading for the Marine Corps. It's on the Commandant's reading list. So you were a Marine? I was not a Marine uh, in in the sense that when I was there, I was a civilian. But uh, the Marines that I was with considered me a Marine because I wore a Marine uniform. and I carried out one of those guys in a firefight and everything else. That's what Marty was telling me. That's pretty impressive that you would do, do, do that. Well, Pat, you're you're an example of what I would call a citizen soldier, you know, which is really an early American concept. Uh, you know, you've got here a volunteer, right? You're a <laughs> and volunteer. a lot of it was because I, I didn't get paid anything for that that trip. Actually, I was on my own. I paid my own way to go to Iraq. I wanted to um, record the stories of um, our guys over there because I didn't think that at the ground level that story was being told. And I wanted to gather oral histories. And I, it's one of the first times it's been done. I, I gathered the oral histories as the battle was going on. And at night, we would I, I'd sit down and find out what happened. Or in some cases, I, re, it was what I still remember, too. Um, and we put together a very detailed 
cinematic view of what that platoon, our, our platoon, went through during the Battle of Fallujah. So how- and it's in their own words. Um, it's really about eight best friends who, from SOI, or effectively boot camp, their whole story, and then going through the Battle of Fallujah. How does an individual get authorization or permission to go to Iraq and participate with the Marine Division? I kind of made it up as I went along. Did did you, did you get permission from the government? <laughs> I uh, I had the well, I was fortunate though in the sense that uh, Secretary of Defense and other people had read my books before that, and they said you can go to Iraq, um, but we're not paying for anything. You have to pay for all your own expenses, and you know you can take it from there. And that's exactly kind of what happened. Did they give you a rifle and ammunition? They. Um, Initially, yes. Uh, what happened is, as the battle unfolded, um, there was nobody, there was no one in that city but insurgents, and we went into the area called the Jolan, which was infested with foreign fighters and Al Qaeda. We actually entered the main Al Qaeda compound and headquarters, and uh, said, "Hey, do you want a rifle?" I said, "Please," huh. and. There was nobody there to protect me. I was completely, I mean, I was there with that group of men, and they were, we were all engaged. There was no one, there was no one there to, that had, I mean, we had each other's backs, but that was it. Did you have a uniform? Or were you wearing a uniform? I did. Or? Yeah, I, I wore a uniform because the um, the foreign fighters and Al-Qaeda, uh, as well as the Rockies that were in that city, were all wearing civilian clothes. And the last thing I wanted to do was be shot by our own guys, <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> that could ruin your whole day. <laughs> well, it could ruin your life. And the thing is, it's it's very easy to do when you see, uh, you know, somebody come in front of you that's wearing. So I, I probably wore that uniform, and uh, it was a uh, it was a very powerful. It's most one of the most powerful experiences of my life. Well, I, I have to tell you, Pat, I, I bought three of your books. I do a lot of books on tape. I bought three of your books on tape last night, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, when we come back, I want to talk about, about some of your other books as well, okay? Okay. We'll be back in a moment on Taking Care of Business on Kern Radio, New 